the origin of today's class came from the initiative that the Forms and Contracts Committee of Metrotex decided to uh, uh, tackle, if you will, earlier this year. And the idea was, rather than simply reviewing contracts and forms, that the Trek Broker Lawyer Committee and TAR Forms Committee sent to us to review, that we would actually go into the community of real estate agents, title people, and mortgage representatives to see what areas we might be able to make clearer or, believe it or not, even shorter and also to identify possibilities for classes just like today where we might be able to increase the level of our understanding as a whole. What became clear from those meetings was that in the Trek one to four family sales contract, for one reason or another, there were areas that were often misunderstood and that needed to, to spend a little time focusing on those. So those ideas uh, came to us in terms of the questions and conversations that we had in our focus groups. For today, we've picked eight of those specific areas for our topics. One is allowances for seller paid closing costs, that is costs that the seller is paying on behalf of the buyer, mineral rights and related disclosures and addenda, appraisals, and specifically how appraisals interact with paragraph 4A1, surveys and the T47 affidavit, exemptions from the seller's disclosure notice, sales where a lease is already in place, and one issue is when does the buyer get the keys to the property and the counterpart is when does the seller have to be out of the property. And then closing up with my uh, soapbox issue, which is paragraph 21, this came up in our meetings frequently, is paragraph 21 notices and what's appropriate to, to put in there and also how it's to be used. So those are our eight topics and uh, let's dive in. I'm sure that you've used paragraph 12A before. It seems to be in residential real estate transactions almost every time that the seller is going to pay some closing costs of the buyer, some because it's regulated by the loan type such as FHA or VA, and sometimes just because the parties have negotiated it in that way. It does have a space for us to put a dollar amount, but I think many times other than just putting the dollar amount in paragraph 12A, we don't spend a lot of time thinking about how the clause works. Actually, the clause works pretty well as long as we understand what it means. We don't contradict it in some way or another. We don't unintentionally double up the closing costs. And we understand how the clause affects a buyer's lender because that's something we might not think about as we're negotiating that between the buyer and the seller. Let's spend just a second and look at what the paragraph actually says. I promise I won't read to you much today, but I'm going to read this one because I think it's important to emphasize a couple of parts. Seller shall pay an amount not to exceed blank dollars, so it be applied in the following order, and then it goes through those, and then the very last clause, and then to other buyer's expenses as allowed by the lender. And again, that's a key to getting the full benefit of the allowance. So we're going to break that down just a little bit. The first one is the not to exceed dollar amount and the blank. It's important to keep in mind that this is a cap or a maximum amount that the seller can pay, the sellers agreed to pay, but it is not a minimum or a guaranteed amount. And if for some reason the entire amount can't be used, uh, the buyer may be upset and the seller may be thrilled and may be really happy about it. So this is not a guaranteed amount, it is a cap and it could be something less than the dollar amount in that blank at the end of the day. The next section is the to be applied in the following order phrase. Uh, there is a specific order of priority for the expenses that the seller will pay for the buyer. and. As I said earlier, sometimes, especially if you're dealing with an FHA or a VA loan, there are specific loans, loan charges, or loan-related expenses that the buyer cannot pay and that the seller must pay. 
And so that would apply to those and then ultimately uh, on to other things that the lender allows. Which leads us to the last part of the clause and the real focus of our conversation this morning. The last eight words of this paragraph regarding the priority of expenses are the key here. And that is other buyer's expenses as allowed by lender. So we have to take into consideration any limits that the lender or the loan program that the borrower is applying for might put on the particular cap that we've seen in 12A. Now, it's not that the lender doesn't want the buyer to get the benefit of that. Not at all. In fact, usually the lender and the buyer have a very good rapport and good relationship, and the lender would love to see the buyer get all the benefit of that. But there are strict underwriting guidelines and rules that the lender has to follow or else the lender can't make the loan. And of course the reason is if the lender doesn't follow the guidelines for that type of loan, they can't resell the loan. And that means if they can't resell it, then their capital or the amount that they've loaned to the borrower is tied up. And that's never good for a lender when their, their capital is tied up in sidelines into a loan transaction that they can't sell. Because the lifeblood of a lender is to be able to resell the loan and get the money back from that sale and loan it out again and they complete that cycle. So if they don't follow the guidelines, then they can't sell the loan and that money is sidelined for an unknown period of time for that lender. That's a bad day for a lender if they can't sell their loan. So no matter what paragraph 12 says, many loans, almost all loans, have a so-called minimum investment requirement. That means that the buyer has to invest a certain minimum amount of money of their own, not seller con contributions, but the buyer's contributions. For example, FHA typically has a 3.5% minimum contribution. In conventional loans, that amount's going to vary depending on the program, and the loan to value ratio, and a lot of other aspects. In VA loans, there are some guidelines, but many times VA programs don't require a minimum investment. They will loan the veteran pr pretty much 100% in many cases. Now, when an allowance exceeds the lender's minimum investment that's required, what's left over uh, doesn't go to the buyer. And I've heard many arguments between listing agents and buyer's agents because the buyer feels cheated somehow and they feel frustrated when the seller doesn't pay the entire amount that's shown in paragraph 12. This leads to parties sometimes coming up with so-called creative ways to make up the difference. That may be okay, and it may not be okay, but what they do is sometimes they'll add repairs and improvements, or they'll find some other method of settling up the difference between the seller and the buyer. Now, sometimes the lender will allow additional repairs to be added in lieu of the closing costs, and so the parties will enter into an amendment and the amendment will say that the amount in paragraph 12A is changed and that on top of that the seller will do certain repairs. But it typically has to be a lender required repair and can't just be something that the buyer would like to see done or some sort of upgrade or improvement. Other times the lenders will approve it, um, but you have to make sure that you disclose that to the lender. What we can't do is to have agreements between the buyer and the seller that are not properly disclosed by the parties to the lender. Now, sometimes the lender can count closing costs paid by the buyer toward their minimum investment, such as application fee, credit report charges, and appraisal fee. There are others, I'm sure. And if the buyer has paid for this by check, then they can furnish the lender a copy of the front and the back of the check to show that the borrower actually came out of their pocket, it came from their bank account, and that the check actually cleared for that. When a buyer tries to use a credit card toward the minimum investment, that doesn't always work. One, because you don't know if the credit card statement is actually paid down the line, and also it's because the amount is being charged, not actually coming out of the borrower's checking account. So the lender can't really charge, can, can't count an amount paid for closing costs by credit card just because they've charged it, because they don't have a way of tracking it, and it's additional debt, so that doesn't really help. 
Sometimes people will use a money order instead of a check or a credit card, and that's okay, but the problem is that it's really hard to get the backside of a money order showing that it was actually cashed. And so the lender often will disallow that when they're thinking about whether they will allow the closing cost to be counted toward the minimum investment or not. Now, paragraph 11 is a danger spot for a lot of different uh, interactions between buyers and sellers uh, and is a black hole that sometimes we fall into. When we're talking about allowances, it's a particularly dangerous part because we run into conflicts between paragraph 12, where we have entered the amount that the seller is going to pay for the buyer, and provisions of paragraph 11. For one reason or another, sometimes agents will type into paragraph 11 an additional clause. Sometimes they say, well, I want my buyer or my seller to be comfortable with this, so we've explained it again. But the problem becomes that we aren't always clear when we write these clauses whether the amount in paragraph 11 is the same dollar amount as we're talking about in paragraph 12a or if it's on top of that. And I've seen some really sad situations where the agent was only trying to be helpful, but it ended up coming out of their pocket because the parties had a disagreement. Of course, you can imagine that the buyer is going to think that it's going to be two different amounts because they get a, t a bigger amount credited to them, and the seller is going to think that it's the same amount. So it's important to make sure that it's clear if we're talking about the same thing in 11 and 12, or if it's two different things, if we absolutely have to put something in paragraph 11 at all. Best not to put it in there at all if we don't have to. Now, one thing, just a word to the wise, sometimes agents say, well, we'll just handle that outside of closing. Well, that's okay, but only okay if the lender approves it. And you want that appro approval in writing. You don't want to have a situation where the lender orally says, yes, y'all just handle that outside of closing, and the parties go out on the parking lot uh, after the, the closing, and then they hand off a check. Uh, because this could be considered loan fraud. Uh, not that anyone has fraudulent intent, but it's important that the lender be made aware of it and that they approve it. One additional item is that any concession between the seller and the buyer has to be accounted for in the appraisal of the property. That's in the new appraisal standards that were implemented a few months ago. So important that the lender and the appraiser have that information so that they can make an accurate appraisal of the property. All right, our second topic for today is mineral rights. Of course, we have a great addendum that Trek has written. Maybe not perfect, but it really works pretty well. And when we use it and use it correctly, it helps keep us all out of trouble most of the time. As, as you know, because of new technology, it's led to new exploration, new drilling, and new production of gas from the Barnett Shale. Now, those of you who practice primarily in the eastern half of the Metroplex, the eastern part of North Texas, may not have dealt with this as much as those in the western half. But I'm sure that you all are aware that you've seen increased negotiations between the parties over the oil, gas, and mineral rights and a lot of confusion among real estate agents as to what those rights are and how they transfer and, and how they should write their contracts to protect one side or the other. Problems come up though when we're using this form and we are using also the reservation of oil and gas and other minerals form uh, in, in the drafting part. Now in terms of disclosures, there's really a good form there that's very helpful and I would encourage you to use it. Um, there are some other brokerage firms that have their own form of disclosure. And the benefit in using one of these forms that have been well drafted and vetted is that you don't have to practice law. You can give this to your client and then if they later say, well, you didn't tell me anything about it, you can point them back to the disclosure form that you did give to them. Hopefully you've kept a copy with their signature would be nice too but at least you've given it to them. Maybe you've sent it to them by email and you have a way of proving it. And you've given that, that disclosure to your buyer or to your seller so that they have the information. And of course, you can always refer them out to legal counsel if they need to. I think one final point on the disclosures though is to remember that this is not a part of our contract. It's not an addendum. It's not an amendment. It's only a disclosure form. 
And so that has a different weight in the transaction, and it's more to give the parties the information they need and also to protect our backside if something ever comes up. Now, one thing that's commonly misunderstood about transfers in Texas, Texas law for many, many years has presumed that when a seller is selling the land, he's selling property, that they're also selling the subsurface in that property. So the oil, gas, and other minerals are going to automatically pass with the sale of the property unless the seller does something specific to keep those rights in the subsurface. If the seller doesn't do anything to reserve their rights in the oil, gas, and other minerals, then whatever the seller owns is going to pass to the buyer automatically. Now, when you're using the TREC form addendum for a reservation of oil, gas, and other minerals, and the seller is not going to be retaining anything, please don't put seller reserve 0%. The truth is, if the seller is not keeping anything, any of the mineral rights that they might have, you don't even need the addendum. And you don't need to be tempted to write something in paragraph 11. This particular addendum, though, is only to be used in situations where the seller is going to keep some or all of their oil, gas, and mineral rights. Okay, so if the seller is keeping none, you don't need it at all. Another way to look at this situation is that when it comes to our contracts and our deeds signed at closing, that silence equals conveyance of whatever the seller does own. Now, that doesn't guarantee that the seller owns anything. It's just whatever they've got will pass to the buyer, whether it's 0%, 100%, or anything in between. If they own that percentage and nothing has been said in the contract, then that percentage is going to pass to the buyer. And, of course, as you know, most of us sellers don't really know what we own in terms of mineral rights anyway, and so we're guessing or we're basing, up what some, basing it on what someone else has told us in the past. Again, TREC has given us a very useful tool to let us keep the rights. That's the addendum for reservation of oil, gas, and other minerals. As long as it's filled out correctly, this form works very well. But I would say one word to the wise there, if it doesn't fit your needs, then get with an oil and gas attorney to help you. If you try to reserve oil, gas, and other minerals any other way, that is, either using the addendum that TREX provided or getting with a qualified oil and gas lawyer, it's just really dangerous, and you've crossed the line into practicing law. All too often I see agents writing clauses that they've put in to make the buyer or the seller more comfortable with the transaction, let them have some assurance that it's going as they think it is. And these clarifying or comfort provisions often are in conflict with the addendum and don't really express what the parties intend. Uh, a lot of times we end up doing a clarifying amendment at the closing to make clear what the parties really intended because there's a conflict between that addendum and what we've written in paragraph 11 or in some addendum. Now, typically we don't see this, but once in a while we'll see in paragraph 2D exclusions that the seller is attempting to retain their oil, gas, and mineral rights. Paragraph 2 is not the place for oil, gas, and mineral rights reservations. It's only for items that are being retained by the seller and being removed from the property before closing. And if the seller is going to reserve and keep and remove all of their mineral rights, oil, gas, and minerals from the property, they're going to need a big shovel and it's going to be a long night for them uh, and they're going to have a hard time getting all those minerals out of the property before closing. So tongue in cheek, obviously they can't do that and if you read paragraph uh, 2, clearly it doesn't allow the seller to reserve their minerals in that spot. The other spot that we often see is, uh, is, in, paragraph 12, uh, is in paragraph 11. It's a dangerous place to put any kind of oil, gas, and mineral clause. Um, in fact, paragraph 11 will tell you, if you read the first part of it that's pre-printed, it says that we are not supposed to write special provisions when Trek has given us a, subject, a form for that particular subject. And we do have that addendum already. We've talked about that. 
One thing that you might know, maybe not, when we write a clause that is vague or ambiguous, if it ever goes to court, the court's going to interpret it against us and our client and in favor of the other side. And this particular type of clause are super tricky to write. It's very difficult. So I would encourage you to leave that to the experts. I certainly do. If your client needs more assurance, you can refer them to an oil and gas attorney. If they don't know one, this is a good website for you to look at. Annette mentioned earlier the Texas Board of Legal Specialization. This is an offshoot of the State Bar of Texas, and it's a great tool to find a specialist of any kind, whether it might be bankruptcy or family law or estate planning, uh, and certainly it's a good source for an oil and gas attorney and will give you their contact information. You can dial it down to the particular zip code and it will give you a list of all of the board certified attorneys for that particular area of law. So it's a good source and it's a safe referral tool when you're referring people out to an attorney if they don't know one. They can go to this website and it's very simple to use. Now if you're a listing agent one of the things that sellers sometimes will tell you as you're listing the property that they want to retain all of their oil, gas, and mineral rights. And they may even insist that you put that in the listing agreement. And there's a trap there for the unwary. If they later decide that they are going to allow their minerals to pass, you're going to have to change your listing agreement. Because many times I've heard sellers coming back on the listing agent saying, Remember, I told you back when I signed the listing that we were going to reserve our mineral rights, but you didn't do that in the contract. And even though the seller has signed the contract agreeing to let their minerals pass, their listing agreement says something different. So I would encourage you to go back and get that listing agreement changed, or else you may get to uh, pay the seller some money, or commissionectomy as I call it. Now, if another agent writes something in paragraph two, which they should never do, or paragraph 11, or any other place, actually, get some competent legal advice. You may want to strike the clause and require that change to be initialed as you're negotiating it. It's just not worth it, and the risk there is too great. So get that out of there. Get some good advice. All right, moving on to appraisal issues in paragraph 4A1. In one of the recent revisions of 4A1, we saw the Broker Lawyer Committee split the loan contingency into two parts. One was approval of the property for the loan, and the other was approval of the buyer's credit and financial ability to handle the loan. And I think they did an admirable job of clarifying that. In the past, it was just kind of one big jumbled up mess, and now it's been split into two parts. Specifically, paragraph 4A1 was rewritten to separate out the property approval from the borrower's credit approval. And the property is the focus of paragraph 4A1. Okay? So what it says in effect is that the property must be approved by the underwriter for the lender or else the buyer has the right to terminate the contract any time before closing. So the property's got to be approved by the lender. That's what 4A1 says. Now, the Broker Lawyer Committee gave us three specific examples appraisal, insurability, and lender required repairs, but there are a ton of other things if we spend some time we could think of. Those are just three specific repairs, uh, specific examples, forgive me. Many agents don't understand how 4A works though, especially when it comes to appraisals. We see the word appraisal there and we assume that if the appraisal comes in below sales price that we automatically have a way out of the contract on behalf of the buyer not necessarily so. Okay? So when the appraisal comes in low or below the sales price, problems arise, of course. As long as the lender's underwriter approves that appraisal, the buyer does not have a right of termination under 4A1. That's the lender has to approve it, not the buyer. Okay? Now when the buyer's making a smaller down payment, uh, then the lender probably is going to disapprove the loan disapprove the property for the loan based on the appraisal because their loan-to-value ratio is too low. But problems come up when the buyer's putting more money down or especially if they're going to pay all cash, then that's an issue. If the buyer's going to put down a large down payment or again if they're going to pay all cash and the appraisal comes in low, 
then uh, the buyer may be really upset. If they're getting a loan and they put a large down payment and the loan-to-value ratio is still okay with the lender, then the buyer does not have the right to terminate the contract under this clause, even though the appraisal comes in below sales price. So a couple of examples. Let's say that we have a $250,000 sale. The borrower is going to put down 10%. They're going to borrow at $225,000. The appraisal comes in at $225,000. Well, the lender may disapprove the loan because their loan-to-value ratio is too close. And the buyer may have a right to terminate if the lender disapproves that under 4A1. Now, if we take the same setting, though, where we have two fifty dollars as the sales price, but the borrower is putting down $100,000, and they're borrowing one fifty, dollars if the appraisal comes in at two twenty-five, dollars the lender may be fine with the appraisal, and the buyer may be nuclear mad because they think that they can terminate, but they can't. So I think that points out the difference between the lender approving the appraisal or not. Now, one thing that is a little frustrating sometimes, to, especially to listing agents and sellers, is that the deadline for terminating under 4A1, assuming that the lender disapproves the property, is the closing date. So the buyer has a right to terminate all the way up to the closing date. And that's true even if the deadline in the third-party finance addendum has already gone past. It has nothing to do with that. In other words, we have two separate termination clauses. Paragraph 4A1 relates to the property being approved for the loan, and there is a termination right for that if the lender disapproves it. And then we have the termination right in the third-party finance addendum, and that relates to the borrower's credit approval and financial ability to handle the loan. These are two totally separate deadlines and two timelines but they both relate back to the lender and to the loan and to the borrower. Now one solution to this situation is to add an additional clause in paragraph 11 or an addendum. And I see these fairly often, but keep in mind that writing that clause is practicing law. They're tougher to write than they might appear and many times what I see written in these clauses does not have the so-called what if part to it. What happens if the appraisal doesn't happen? It just says that it must, but it doesn't say what happens if it doesn't. It happens if it doesn't. Again, remember that if someone, one of us, for example, writes a clause that's ambiguous or vague, the court's going to interpret it against us and our client and in favor of the other side. So that kind of sobers you up when you're thinking about that. Okay, let's talk about surveys and T47s. Now, obviously, surveys play a very important role in real estate transactions. Buyers care about them. Lenders certainly want to know what the nature of the property is that they're loaning money on. And the title company needs to see it so that they have appropriate uh, provisions in their title policies. It's become common in the past decade or so to use existing surveys for residential transactions in particular. And this saves some transactional costs, which is a good thing, it saves the buyer some costs. Uh, others think it's always a good idea to get a fresh survey, and I agree with them whenever you can, that's a good idea if you can afford it. Sometimes the existing survey can be used or recycled, and sometimes it can't. When you look at paragraph 6C1, many times agents are confused by what that means. And a lot of times, perhaps because it's the first block you come to or because it's become commonplace, that's the clause that gets marked by agents when they're preparing the contract. They'll mark 6C1 and then they'll fill in the rest of the blank. They'll mark the days and they'll mark buyer and seller further down in the clause. We have to keep in mind that there are two things required by paragraph 6C1, and they have to be delivered by the seller to the buyer within the days that are stated there, so within blank days after the effective date. One is a copy of the existing survey, and the second is a T47 affidavit. 
Now, if the seller actually does deliver both of those things, that's the survey and the T-47, then it becomes the title company and lender's role to approve or disapprove it. If both the title company and the lender approve the survey based on the T-47 affidavit being with it, then there's no problem. You move forward to closing and you use that for closing. But if either the title company or the lender disapproves the survey, then we look at the checkbox in 6C1 to see who's going to pay for a new survey. And that's the only situation where that checkbox applies, as we're going to see in just a moment. The problems come up when a seller delivers one or the other. They deliver the survey, but not the T-47 affidavit. Or they deliver one or the other after the deadline that's given in paragraph 6C1. If the seller doesn't deliver both of those things on time, that is, before the deadline, then no matter which box is checked in 6C1, the seller is always going to pay for a new survey. Another way to look at this is if the seller doesn't, if they do what they're supposed to do, what they agreed to do, and they do it on time, then the check boxes apply. If the lender or the title company disapprove the survey, then you look to those boxes to see who pays for a new one. But if the seller doesn't do what they've agreed to in the contract, or if they do it late, then the seller has to pay for a new survey. That's the way the clause is written. Now, a few uninformed agents, I'm sure none of you who are listening today would ever think this or say it, but I've been told to my face that there's this new thing called a T-47 affidavit, and we can use that instead of a survey. And that's just wrongheaded. It's just not true. You have to have both a survey and a T-47. Once in a while, we'll get an affidavit from an agent that says that the survey is not available or there is none. Well, in that situation, we've just confirmed that we didn't deliver the existing survey. We only delivered the T-47 affidavit, and the seller gets to buy a new survey. That's the way paragraph 6C1 works. Some agents have started requiring that they get a copy of the existing survey when they take the listing. Otherwise, they automatically mark 6C2 or even 6C3 so that they know that they don't have to put their buyer, their seller or their buyer in that spot. It's certain who's going to pay for it. Next up on our topics today is seller's disclosure issues. Now, we could spend a whole day on just this topic, honestly, and we're not going to talk so much about what's supposed to go in the cert, into the seller's disclosure form, but the focus here is on who does and who does not have to fill out the form. Now, for this purpose, this section, we're going to talk about the seller's disclosure form itself, um, and we'll talk about in a moment that there are different forms that are available to be used, but they all have to have certain minimum requirements. Um, also, what if the seller is exempt from completing that form, but they do know about a material defect in the property? The Texas Property Code, which is the law that covers seller's disclosures, um, has certain requirements in it, and there's actually a sample form that you can go look at. It lists the ones that do not have to fill out the form. That is, if you're a seller and you fit into this category, you do not have to fill out the seller's disclosure form itself. So one example is a lender who's foreclosed their mortgage and is selling the property as an REO property. They don't have to fill out this form. Be careful not to confuse that with RELO, because a relocation seller does have to fill one out in most cases, but REO, or real estate owned, is one that's been foreclosed and resold by the lender, and so they do not have to fill out the form. The most commonly misunderstood exemption for the seller's disclosure is regarding estates, executors, and trustees. And there are exemptions for those as sellers in the statute, no question about it. But when the trustee or the executor is also a beneficiary of the estate or the trust, they still have to complete the seller's disclosure form just to be safe. The reason is that they have a secondary role in the transaction as a beneficiary or owner 
I'll give you an example. A few years ago, my mother passed away, and she left a will naming me and my brother as co-executors of her estate. And for various reasons that aren't relevant here, we decided that we would not go through and uh, we would not probate the will, but we were both named as executors in that situation. And because we were also the beneficiaries or owners of the property, we did go ahead and complete a seller's disclosure notice because we knew that we had to complete that. Now, as I mentioned a minute ago, there is a form for seller's disclosure in the Texas Property Code. If you go look it up, you can see it. It's right there on the Texas Legislature online. There are many other forms, actually several that are available for you to use. TAR has one, several associations have their own, and each of those forms also includes the same elements that, has, uh, that are in the Property Code disclosure form. But they go farther than that, and they have other disclosures that are not included in the Texas statutory form and that aren't required by Texas law. They are in the GAR form and the association form. So those go farther than the probate, the, pardon me, the property code form does. If you have a situation where a seller wants to use the one in the Texas property code, you could refer them to a real estate attorney for advice. But keep in mind that you cannot force them to use the TAR or association form if they want to use the one out of the property code. And you're not putting yourself or your company in any kind of danger. It just may not have as many of the disclosures in there as the one that your association provides or TAR puts in there. Now, one of the most shocking things is that even if a seller isn't required to complete the seller's disclosure form itself, but they know something materially is wrong with the property, a material defect exists, they still have to make a written disclosure of that defect or else face the consequences. So just because you don't have to fill out the seller's disclosure form doesn't mean you can hide behind that fact and not tell what you do know about the property. Now, it's important to keep in mind too, sellers don't have to go out of their way to inspect the property and find every last detail of something that's wrong with the property, but they do have to disclose what they do know relating to the property. So I always tell clients when they call me, better to over-disclose than under-disclose. Tell everything you know, or when in doubt, spell it out. And as always, when it comes to seller's disclosures, uh, refer your clients to a, an attorney who really does know this area of the law. A good real estate lawyer is invaluable for that purpose. Now this one's been intriguing, talking about properties that are being sold that have a lease already in place. The last go-round of our revisions of the TREC form have provisions for that disclosure to go on. It requires the seller to give the buyer a copy of the existing lease and any move-in condition form. The problem is, the way it's written, those don't have to be given to the buyer until closing. Okay? So what if the lease has all kinds of crazy provisions that the buyer doesn't like or not willing to live with? I've seen some crazy things in leases, free rent periods, seller has to repair everything under the sun, I've seen some very long lease terms, and if you're looking to own or occupy, a long lease term might be a real problem for you. And I've seen some very short lease terms, whereas if I'm an investor and I'm looking for a, an income stream, that might be a problem from that side, so I might want a longer one. So if I don't have a chance to see the lease before closing, then I don't have a chance to protect myself and to make an informed decision. I'm hoping that in the future the Trek Broker Lawyer Committee will revise this provision, but until that time, um, here's one way to handle that, uh, that uh, particular challenge. Get a copy of the lease and the move-in condition form and attach it to the contract while you're negotiating it. As you're going through the counteroffer process, mark it on paragraph 22 and attach them as an addendum to the contract. There's nothing wrong with that. 
the tail end of paragraph 22 has an other attachment blank and you can just type in lease and move in condition form and move on down the line. If you do that while you're reviewing that, or as you're negotiating the contract rather, it makes it easy for the buyer to use their termination option under paragraph 23, assuming that they've got that right, to terminate or negotiate an amendment with the seller and they at least have that chance to review it before the closing. Now, one of the issues that came up in our conversations with the focus group is when does the buyer get the keys and when does the seller have to be out of the property? Well, in our Trek 1 to 4 family contract, paragraph 10 clearly covers that. Shows that the seller will deliver the buyer possession on closing and funding or according to a temporary lease for the seller or the buyer. Of course, if there is a temporary lease for the seller or the buyer, that's going to control possession. When there isn't one in place, since the contract doesn't have a specific time of day, it just has closing and funding, and we have to assume that possession is due whenever closing and funding happens. The question becomes, what's closing and funding? Well, closing and funding is when all the documents have been signed and handed over to the title company, all the conditions of the closing have been met from all the parties and the lender and the title company. The lenders reviewed the documents and approved the funding, or the closing and funding. All the parties' money has reached the title company. It's actually in their account or ready for deposit. Funding authorization has come from the lender. And finally, the title company is ready to either send the wire or cut a check for the seller's proceeds. Now keep in mind, many times a lender will say, with all good intentions, they'll say that the transaction is funded. And what they really mean is that the lender has given their permission to release funds and to move forward with the transaction. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the lender's money has arrived in the title company's account, or that all other conditions or requirements of the closing have been taken care of. And so when a loan officer tells the parties that it's been funded, Many times they don't have the authority to say that. It's really the closing department or the closing manager uh, who will actually have to give that authority. So it's important to keep that in mind. Now, what is closing and funding in a short sale scenario where there's no money going to the seller? Well, it's when the documents and the money are delivered to the title company that are needed for closing and all other requirements of the closing have been met. Also in a cash transaction, same thing. You have all the documents and money in the title company's hands and all the requirements for the closing have already been taken care of. Now paragraph 21, as I said, is one of my particular soapboxes because I've seen so many good agents just like yourselves get into a problem and I hate that. Paragraph 21 is where we see the rules of the game, so to speak, for notices from one party to the other party. That's seller to buyer or buyer to seller. There are actually four ways to deliver a notice under paragraph 21 from one party to the other party. First is hand delivery, email if there is an email address that's been filled in, fax if there's a fax number filled in, or finally snail mail even though that's not a very good option in most cases. One commonly misunderstood part of paragraph 21 because there's still a blank in 21 for a telephone number. The common misconception is that you can make a phone call and transfer a notice. That's not true. If you read paragraph 21, it says it must be in writing and that knocks out the phone number. So what happens if there's nothing filled in on the other side? If you're working with the seller, there's nothing filled in for the buyer. Or if you're working with the buyer, it's on the seller. Well, that leaves you only with hand delivery as the only method possible. Keep in mind that there really isn't an option for delivery to the other agent. So that doesn't count under paragraph 21 unless the other agent's contact information is what's been put into paragraph 21. It's not a bad idea to send the other agent a copy or even the title company for that matter. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt anything. That's a mark of professionalism and courtesy. 
but the notice has to go to the other party according to whatever information is in paragraph 21. Keep in mind, too, that delivering a copy of the notice to the title company does not count for paragraph 21. So I guess another way to say this, if the sender, whether it's the buyer or the seller sending it, doesn't follow the rules of paragraph 21, it's just as if no notice was ever sent. So here's an example of the wrong way to do it. Paragraph 21 shows the seller's email as seller at seller.com. The buyer decides that they're going to terminate under paragraph 23. The buyer sends out the notice of termination to the listing agent that's working with the seller, but they don't send it to seller at seller.com, which is what was in paragraph 21. Well, in that situation, the buyer has not complied with paragraph 21, and the buyer has not properly terminated the contract. Here's the right way. If paragraph 21 shows that the seller's email address is seller at seller.com and the buyer wants to terminate, then the buyer's agent sends the notice of termination to seller at seller.com and they want to send a copy to listing agent at listings.com, then they've complied with the contract and they've properly terminated. Many agents have the idea that if they're dealing with an agent on the other side, then they can send the notice to the other agent and that complies with paragraph 21. That is typically not true. The reason is in Texas, real estate agents are so-called special agents, not general agents under Texas law. And paragraph 21 sets out the rules and we have to follow those rules if we're gonna comply with it. I hear a common complaint that the other agent doesn't fill in the blanks in paragraph 21 for their client. So the other side leaves it blank, if you will. Uh, one, you can certainly tell them, remind them that TREC requires that we are, fill all the blanks in on our contract forms and that's one of the blanks. Um, also, if you happen to get to the point where the contract is fully signed up, fully executed, you could always do an amendment that gives a delivery method. And I would encourage you, if you get into that spot, to go ahead and add that. Also, you can start the process or prime the pump, if you will, by writing in an email address or a fax number or even a mailing address for the other side. There's nothing illegal or unethical about doing that. If they don't like what you write in there, they can always change it during the negotiation process before the contract is signed. Now, one thing I've seen agents do in recent months is to put, um, a, put their own information in the notices blank and first I would say please, please check with your broker to see if that's okay with them, your managing broker. That's a really dangerous process and there's a lot of risk involved if you put your contact information in there and you're putting yourself and your broker at risk. Uh, if you decide to go ahead and do that anyway, uh, double check your E&O coverage and make sure that you're okay. Make sure that you get every notice that comes to you to your client right away. I want to thank you today. I've enjoyed visiting with you and uh, hopefully we've clarified a few things as we go. Um, questions now, we're going to take as many as we have time for. All right, so first question up is related surveys and T47 affidavits. If a survey and T47 affidavit are provided by seller and accepted by the buyer's lender and the title company, is it correct that the buyer would have no recourse against the surveyor in the event there was an issue after closing since the buyer did not contract for the survey to be done? Um, that's an excellent question and the answer it is correct. There is no contractual liability from a surveyor to a subsequent holder of that survey and they would not have liability if there was an error or something left off. So great question and unless you're the one that contracted for the survey, you do not have a right to go back against the seller. That's one good reason to have a new survey done. But the uh, surveyors have actually started adding uh, disclaimers and they're, they say specific parties. Uh, they'll say this is something prepared for John Jones and Mary Jones, as well as ABC Title and XYZ Lender, and only those parties have a right to rely on that. So. Uh, if you're not one of those parties, you do not have the right to rely or go back against them. All right, next question is, is an investor seller ever required 
to provide a seller's disclosure since they never lived in the property? Another excellent question from our same uh, participant. Thank you for that question as well. Absolutely yes. It doesn't, it's not a requirement that you live in the property in order to complete the seller's disclosure or be obligated to complete it. Uh, for example, you could be someone that managed the property. Um, you could have written checks to pay for repairs. You might have inspected the property. And even though you might not know everything about it, uh, you have enough knowledge that you have to tell what you do know. And again, it doesn't mean that you have to have the same level of knowledge that a uh, person that occupied the property would have relating to it. It just means that you've got to disclose what you do know. Okay, great question. Thank you very much. Our next one is, can the real estate agents be in the notices only, or does it have to be the buyer and the seller? The, the way our contract is written, it does not prohibit an agent from putting their contact information in there as the contact for the buyer or the seller. So it can be just the real estate agents, but again, my concern is there are risks and liabilities for the agents and the brokers involved especially if there were to be a notice that the parties did not know about or it was missed. Perhaps it went into a spam email. Perhaps it was supposed to be faxed uh, and it was not received. Uh, or like happened a few weeks ago, I know a major brokerage firm, they had lost their entire email account for two days. And if it had been sent by email and they didn't receive their email for a couple of days, their client might do something that they wouldn't otherwise do and so um, that would create liability on the agent who was receiving it. So you can do it. It's not illegal, unethical, immoral. It just creates particular risk. Now, one of the things that I have seen in recent months is going into paragraph 11 or even below the address labels uh, or lines for the parties in paragraph 21, it will say that a copy is to go to the agent. And I don't discourage that. Probably paragraph 11 is a better place for that, to say that copies of any notices sent from one party to the other party would also be copied to the agents involved. I think that's a good point of professionalism, but it's not set up for that at this time. All right, great question, thank you. Next one relates to paragraph 21 again. What if the selling agent does not provide delivery information in the contract? Well, um, if they don't have that, then we're left with one choice and one choice only under paragraph 21, and that is hand delivery. I'll never forget when we first got the paragraph 23 option to terminate, I got a phone call one Friday afternoon from a dear friend of mine who was a real estate agent working with the buyer, and they said, we're going to try to negotiate a termination or, pardon me, an amendment of the contract tomorrow but tomorrow night, Saturday night at midnight, is the deadline for the end of the option period. And if we decide to terminate, how do I deliver that notice to the seller? And I asked them to pull the copy of the contract out, and I asked them what are, what's typed into the blank for the seller's notice in paragraph 21. And they said, well, there's nothing typed in there. I said, no fax, no. There's no email, no. There's no snail mail typed in. So they said, what do I do? How do I deliver the notice? I said, well, if you read paragraph 21, it says hand delivered. So I said, where is the seller? And they said, well, they're in northern Oklahoma. And I said, well, when's the last time you saw beautiful northern Oklahoma? Because you're going to get to drive up there. So it's a really tough spot. And I think the, the proactive stance is to make sure that you don't put yourself in that spot. And again, you could in, even write in information for them, write in the agent's uh, uh, email address or the seller's email address or uh, look, uh, you know, some, write the property address in something. As long as you comply with paragraph 21, that's the main thing. All right, our next question is the notion of contacting the other agent uh, client directly to deliver notices presents a problem. Okay, this is a common question and a very, very good one. I'm glad you brought this up. Thank you. 
That is the idea of having direct conversation between the listing agent and the buyer or the selling agent and the seller uh, creates some ethical concerns, makes us uncomfortable. I think the key thing here is that the document has to be in writing and signed by the seller or the buyer, whoever is delivering the notice, whoever is sending it, and then the agents become the way that the notice gets delivered. And as long as you don't embellish on that, you don't add to that some sort of negotiation or try to persuade the client or the other side to do something or to think a certain way, then you are not crossing an ethical boundary just by being the method of delivery. So a couple of examples. You could get the notice of termination signed by the buyer and fax it to the seller if, if the seller's fax number is in paragraph 21. Or you could scan it and email it to the seller if their email address is in there without having any fear of being in trouble. And you might want to copy the other agent at the same time so that they know that, they're aware of what's happening. But you're not, you're not going to get in trouble there. That's just fine. Okay? You could not go further, though, and have a conversation about negotiation or about the property or try to persuade them to agree to something. You just have to deliver it. And that could apply even in an extreme case of hand delivery. All right. The question that comes up next relates to paragraph 4A1, and that is, uh, why is there not a date under 4A1 to protect the seller? The, the real reason is, first, the, the clause does say that it could be terminated all the way up to closing, and as you know many times, the appraiser doesn't get the appraisal to the lender until the last minute, and the lender may not communicate that on to the borrower until later in the process. And if we had a specific day and month in there, or if we had a specific number of days after the effective date, and the appraisal had not come in, or repairs or insurability had not been determined, then the buyer might be forced into a spot where there's a problem that they wouldn't have a solution for and would not have a way of terminating if we'd already passed that deadline certainly agree that, that in some ways it seems unfair to the seller that they don't know until the last minute and then they have the rug pulled out from under them, so to speak, at the last minute just before closing. But there's not another way that I can think of that would protect the buyer and, uh, and still allow them to have the right to walk away if the property is disapproved for any reason by the lender. So uh, certainly understand it. I think if you flip it around and look at it from the buyer's side and the selling agent's side, uh, it looks a little different, and as with many of our clauses, uh, it doesn't cut evenly. We have some clauses that favor one side or the other, and uh, that's tough. Um, one comment, and we're going to finish with this in our one last question, wrap it up. Uh, comment is, is well placed, that is, when you're dealing with an existing survey and the T47 affidavit, um, you could have um, title insurance coverage to ensure that the survey is accurate. And that's absolutely true. The uh, title companies offer uh, survey coverage uh, in the title policy, and in that case then the buyer would not have a claim against the surveyor perhaps, but they would have coverage under their title policy for undisclosed or unknown items. That is, if the survey was wrong or if it left something off that was important, then the buyer, if they got survey coverage in the title policy, they would have the right to go back against the title company and, and they would have probably a lot better chance of getting something done about it, um, and um, even if they didn't have a right to go against the surveyor. So you're right, the title company is taking that risk when they offer survey coverage, uh, which is an optional coverage. It's optional with the buyer if they want that or not. Uh, so when, they, when the title company agrees to get the coverage, then they, uh, they're taking the risk that the surveyors are inaccurate or the survey is incomplete or uh, wrong in some way. So uh, I want to thank you all for your participation today. It's been my pleasure.